because there's only two forces that can pull us or drive us. One of them is fear. And the other one on the other side, I'll call that love or abundance or safety, but it's, it's the opposite of fear. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm joined here with my co-founder of Business of Architecture, Mr. Enoch Sears. Enoch, how are you? Ryan, doing excellent today. Just came back from Peru, still flying very, very high. Excellent. Love it. We'll be interested in doing a podcast all about that adventure in the near future. So we're going to talk today about something that we've been hearing a lot about from some of our clients. We've seen it on the podcast. It's in the news at the moment. And this is not something which is unusual, okay, which is the future potential economic downturn, okay? Oh, uh, oh. No, Ryan, it's, don't say it. Oh, no. it's, 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 is it coming? We don't know. We've been talking about this economic downturn for the last four or five years. The pandemic was a potential trigger of this. I know lots of people have still got um, post-traumatic stress disorder from the 2008 recession, which often guides a lot of people's behaviors today so they can get very, very anxious about uh, the idea of economic downturn. But there is definitely a lot of uncertainty at the moment. We see um, you know, inflation is at a very high rate at the moment. You know, the, if we consider the amount of national debt that a country like the US has, for example, and the, the banks having to print more money and how that's increasing the rate of inflation, and then we're kind of experiencing that on a cost of living crisis. The construction industry and the architecture industry as a related to that is often like the canary in the mine to these sort of economic shifts and changes. Investors start becoming more cautious. They're waiting for things. It becomes more and more expensive to borrow and to lend money. So projects tend to go on hold or they just end up slowing down, which creates difficulties when you're an architect trying to win work. You've got something in your pipeline. You've been in conversations about this project for the last few months. You're about to go over the line. You're almost celebrating. In your mind, you can, you're, you've already spent the money. You're, you're, you've got that $60,000 check. It's already come in. You can see where you've been allocating it. You're paying off those uh, consultants that you're already two weeks behind paying them. You've spent the money already. And then crickets. You don't hear anything. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and ways that practices can prepare for it and also ways that practices can see opportunity. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Beautiful, Ryan. Great explanation. And there's, there's, there's kind of two things we're dealing with here. So the first thing would be the macroeconomic situation, things completely outside of our control. The war in the Ukraine, oil embargoes, the price of commodities, what the United States Treasury does with the interest rate and the dollar, and so many other macroeconomic forces, right? So at one, you know, on one side, as we enter into this conversation, as we discuss this as an industry, as architects, as we look at this, there's things that are just outside of our control. I mean, that's the first thing to say is, yes, there are things outside of our control. There are going to be clients who are going to pause projects. There are going to be projects that just go away. There is going to be, there are going to be uh, less projects in some particular niches, maybe in many niches. So like just standing in a place of recognizing this reality gives us power because you say, okay, cool. I can't control those things, but I know they exist. Now the question is, what 
am I going to do in the situation that I find myself? And so the second thing that I find that impacts us in a situation like this, and I'll speak from my own very personal experience, is fear. The conversation about fear. Because I indeed, I have my own PTSD from 2007, 2008, 2009, when I was laid off for the first time. I had a six-figure job. I was living in a foreign country in Panama, on the border with Panama, Costa Rica, in this little island archipelago called Bocas del Toro. And for the past 12 months, money was flowing everywhere. Like the industry was doing great. The company I was working with, they were investing lots of money in marketing materials and marketing collateral. We were doing lots of renderings and designs for projects that we were going to put on the market, things like condominiums, private residences. It's a very, very exciting time. And within six months of that high point, I found myself living back closer to my family in California with my wife and my three small children on public assistance, meaning in California, that'd be food stamps, a couple side jobs. So throwing newspapers in the middle of the night, substitute teaching during the day just to make ends meet. Now at this time, I didn't have a business. I was an employee and I was a casualty of that. Like so many of us were back in that, that time period, 2008, 2009. And so the, one of the unsaid conversations, Brian, that I find we have is this conversation about fear. Mm. So one of the things that we need to make sure as powerful leaders that we guard ourselves against is spiraling, is letting fear get a hold of our hearts. Because once fear gets a hold of us as practitioners, as leaders, as people who run businesses, we will start making decisions based upon that fear. And oftentimes those very decisions are what lead us into more and more scarcity as opposed to more and more abundance. So there's opportunities. So we know that in the macroeconomic sense, there's going to be ups and downs. And we also know this is going to give the opportunity for powerful leaders to rise up in the architectural industry. For you as you as a powerful leader listening like right now, leading your teams, or maybe you're on a team, maybe you don't have your practice right now, but leading behind the front lines. Like what does it start to look like when we as architects begin leading out of abundance, begin inspiring our developer clients, begin inspiring our clients so that they they move ahead. Because here's like, when we look at what causes an economic downturn at the root, what causes it is fear. Economists will tell you this. This is why they watch the market because it's when, it's when everyone decides that they'd rather save their money and hold on to it rather than spend it and put it out there in the marketplace and let it grow. And the velocity of money continues to grow. But when we become fearful, it's just this compounding thing. So in 2008, what we saw, fear got a hold of the market and then it got in this vicious cycle where it just started spiraling down and 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 down, and down, and down until we hit rock bottom. So hopefully we can learn from that experience. And not everyone will. This is the challenge. Not everyone will. Not everyone's going to have the in- internal certainty to stand with certainty and to make powerful, bold actions during a downturn. But if there's enough of us who are, those who are feeling timorous, those who are feeling overwhelmed, those who are feeling at a loss, those who are feeling scared, can lean on those who, despite the external circumstances, are able to maintain a certainty. Mm. I, I, I'm getting some uh, very deep Peruvian wisdom vibes coming through here. What you're saying, Enoch? Yeah, this but... was this was this is a focus <laughs> of my trip to Peru. Right, it was like fear, man. I went, I went down, I went down to the abyss. <laughs> I went down to the abyss of the bottom of fear. It was like way down in the black hole. Yeah. <laughs> but what, what, what you're saying is, is spot on. And actually, as I'm listening to what you're talking about, it, it's actually, there's quite a lot of freedom in recognizing these things. Yes, there are real impacts to it. However, your experience of it is going to be governed by your fear of it. That is like that we're in control of that we're in control and how we relate to the fear that we're creating around the economic downturn for so many business owners that we speak to or you know that sometimes I interact with when it's getting in a situation of constraint and panic that fear has taken over and 
the perception is that there's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing I can do about the circumstance. There's no opportunities. Everything is closing in. And very rarely is there ever any kind of standing and facing the fear that is hidden beneath you that you're really, really terrified of happening. Um, I, I'll give you a little example of this. The other day, we were I was chatting to one of our clients and they came on the call and they had uh, a couple of very big projects that they had been courting for you know the last few months and they were certain that this project was going to get over the line and they were going to sign it and they were going to get that nice commencement fee check coming in and they were going to be able to make payroll very comfortably and you know profit was going to start coming in and and mentally they'd gone through that process of already spending the money of a project that they hadn't closed yet okay so again that's just a on a side that's always something that we're vulnerable to is we get very attached to projects that we haven't won yet which kind of just leaves us more um vulnerable to being fearful to to the loss of these projects so this project didn't go ahead or the the client had started to ghost them and they had started spinning into a bit of a panic okay what's going to happen i've got i'm going to have to be start start eating into my reserves I'm going to have to start moving this and this around. What if we have to let somebody go, et cetera, et cetera. So we had a conversation about, okay, there's a whole load of things that might happen. And I went really negative, okay? Really, really negative in the call of, all right, well, let's have a look what happens. What's the worst thing that could happen? Okay, well, this product doesn't come through and this doesn't come through. Okay, how much work have you got left? Well, I've already got about four or five months worth of work left. Okay. What's even worse than this situation? How could this get worse? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, imagine that you don't win any work for the next four or five months. Okay, nothing comes in. It totally dries up. We're, head, we're heading into, you know, maybe one of the wars in, around the world gets worse and it really starts to impact the economic situation. What's going to happen then? Well, that's going to be really shit. I'm going to be in a really difficult situation. Okay, Why? What is it? What's actually going to happen? Okay. And we kind of started to actually to go into the fear of, well, end of the day, what would happen if you didn't, if you defaulted on one of the payments that you had or some of the debt, um, and that happened a few times, you're going to have to declare bankruptcy. Okay. What happens when you've declared bankruptcy? Well, you know, what, what's going to happen financially? Well, actually I'd probably be okay because the debt would be gone and there are all these other assets and things that I've got that can can protect me. Okay, so financially, it could be even a better situation if you were to to go bankrupt. No, 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 but I, I couldn't live with myself. It would just be the sense of failure. Okay, all right, now we can start to look at that and isolate it because that's purely psychological. That's purely psychological. Why would it be such a sense of failure? Where's that sense of failure coming from? And so we started on kind of unraveling it in a sort of therapeutic manner and then bringing in some context. Okay, would you still have your family? Yeah, your family would still be there. Okay, kids, still have my kids. Still going to have a roof over your head, house, over your head. Yeah, gonna still have, going to have, have my house. Okay, mortgage all paid off, mortgage is all paid off. Damn, that's a pretty good situation. Now. Okay, you've got some rental income as well. Okay, all right, here we go. And you start to kind of see, okay, there's a there's a, a, a level of stability that was actually there. And actually the things that were most important, family, housing, access to food, those are still going to be present. So it was like, you don't have to play the game if you don't want to. You can just hang it up now and quit. There's always that opportunity. There's always that choice, which totally started to change the frame of... This is a game I'm choosing to play. And when the situation gets difficult, bring it on. Let's see where the opportunity is. So th this, I think, is, you know, it is, it's not easy by any means. And when you're in the, the throes of it and you've got your heart set on and you were expecting some cash coming through and it doesn't happen, and then you've got the fear, you've got the fear of, 
letting go of staff, some people that you've been with for years. Th these are real, emotional, challenging situations, but you can deal with them. You can deal with them. And as you were saying at the beginning there, when stuff is starting to get shaky, the real leaders are able, the ones that are able to step forward and they're able to just provide possibility for everyone else around them. Don't have to provide solutions necessarily, but you do have to provide possibility. The possibility that there's a way through it, there's a way around it, there's another way to do this, something else is going to happen. We don't know what this actually means just yet, so I'm going to withhold making meaning out of it and being able to help other people postpone, withhold their meaning onto the situation. This becomes very, very powerful. And it's so hard because, well, it's so hard not to take life so seriously, but this is something that I'm trying to do a better job at, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which is like, it can seem so serious, you know, it's like, oh, jobs and money and bringing in jobs and providing for the family and everything that goes along with this game, like Ryan says that we're playing. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, let's see, actually last year and the year before, I had a couple of my friends and we were all experiencing an element of scarcity. Um, one of my buddies had invested He'd maxed out his credit cards in health bills for one of his sons. He was um, he's a practicing dentist, and so he was in a partnership with three other dentists. He had he had leveraged himself buying some new equipment, kind of a hail mary pass to invest in a new kind of service offering that they wanted to provide. So he was gambling on investing. He made like a, a an, an acquisition of a sixty thousand dollar piece of equipment that was going to help them really boost the revenue that they were bringing in. At the same time, he was having up and down months. He was trying to invest in advertising to be able to drive new clients for procedures that were more lucrative. And amidst all that, just was barely scraping by with the money. And I just remember talking with him and and having flashbacks of my own time of being in scarcity. And just from where I was standing, I could see that he was going to make it through this. I could see that I'm like, hey, just hold on tight, man. Just it's the psychological mental game. You just got to keep on holding on. Be wise with your money. Mm -hmm. You know, you've overextended yourself. That means you need to or let's, let's not say he's overextended himself, but he extended himself. And so I said, you know, you did that intentionally. You did that for a reason. You invested in menta mentoring. You invested in coaching for a reason. Uh, you believe you did the right decision. So now you need to get out there and work and do the actions that are going to result in a return on investment. And it's, I don't want to, you know, as we're talking about this here on the podcast, I don't want to minimize the very real nature of fear. Like, don't want to minimize it. Oh, it's just fear. It's just, you know, just change your mind, whatever, get over it. Like, it is real. You know, fear will have a visceral bodily reaction in your body. You may feel like you don't want to get up in the morning. You may feel like, you know, you just want to dive into sedation, maybe just watch some movies or check your email incessantly, or maybe just get into this overworking nonsense where we're always in the hustle and the grind. Like, if I just work harder, if I stay later, I'm going to get ahead of the ball sometime when we've never actually addressed the fact that we're operating out of fear. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you mentioned my trip to Peru. Indeed, I went on a retreat down there. And one of the powerful things that happened at this retreat was inquiring into the nature of fear and inquiring into the nature of my own fear and seeing how fear, like in the universe, there's only, this is my perspective, what I'm discovering is there's only two forces that, that, that can pull us or drive us. One of them is fear. And the other one on the other side, I'll call that love or abundance or safety, but it's it's the opposite of fear. And these two things are always, they're in like this constant pull. And so for you listening to the podcast, they might be like, all right, Enoch and Ryan, come on, give me some, give me some tactics or strategies. How do I, how do I, what, how would I actually do in the face of a downturn? Well, I mean, those things we can tell you pretty quickly. So number one, make sure you're planning and to plan properly, you need to have the right data. Okay. So that means you need to have the right numbers. You need to be looking at your 13 week cash flow forecast. You can do a search on for business of architecture cash flow forecast. And we have a training video for free that's on YouTube along with the downloadable spreadsheet. This will give you a three month look ahead to see what your estimated income and outgoings are going to be every single week for the next 13 weeks, which is going to give you an incredible feeling of peace and certainty and calmness because you're going to see whether you're going to be making a profit or if potentially your revenue is going to fall off a cliff or you're in danger of not having enough money, that's going to be clear as well, which is great news because now you have three months to do something about it as opposed to being in the midst of it. Like, oh, now our bank account just got overdrawn by $20,000. Oh, shoot. Now, we, now we're in damage control. We have to dip into our credit line or, man, maybe I need, a, I need to return the car that I'm leasing. 
and just take these these austerity measures, which is not fun. So number one, make sure you're planning. Number two, tracking. Planning is based upon the proper tracking. And then number three, making sure that you're you're developing business. You're looking at the you're looking at your niches, the products you're on. Are you saying is is the market I'm in is it at risk because of the economics? If so, do I need to diversify? Do I need to start partnering with other firms? How can I diversify? And then this gets into the conversation about opportunities. And one of my, many of my mentors who are much wealthier, more successful, and more abundantly minded than I am, have always told me, Enoch, you know, in recessions, this is when millions are made. This is when some of the greatest opportunity actually happens. And of course, the people who are making millions are, uh, there's a couple ways to do that. Number one, you can exploit the situation <laughs> by selling, you know, ten dollar bottles of water to people who are out of out, out of water, and that's not what we recommend. <laughs> you know, that's if you're listening to this podcast, I go listen to another podcast, you rascal, bringing down humanity. But the other side of the coin is you can make millions in the service of your fellow human being in ways that are powerful, helping provide solutions that are needed where people are getting an adequate return on their investment for what you're actually doing and and helping humanity get through some of these difficult waters that are ahead of us. So plan, track, business development, get out there, call people, make sure you have a sales process. So Ryan mentioned earlier, one of the problems in economic downturn is having people ghost us, having, you know, you've been in talks, they've told you how great you are. They've told you they love your design. They're saying, this is amazing. This is amazing. And then all of a sudden, radio silence. It's completely silent. And you're wondering, oh, what's happening now? What happened? Well, a number of things could, could be happening, right? I heard from a client recently that this happened to, to them. The person went client, the, the person went silent, the potential client. And then a week later, the potential client wrote them an email and the email said, hey, uh, you know, like we were looking around at other firms and we found another firm that's more prominent than you are. And we're going to go with this firm instead. It's like, oh, so while you can't prevent things like that happening, in a good sales process, you're, you, there are things that can minimize those things from happening to you. So got to have a good sales process in your practice. You got to know how to make sure that you don't get ghosted because it's possible. This is something we teach every single day in smart practice in the poll method. So I, I think this is very interesting, okay, that there's yeah, there is a number of different tactics and strategies that people can be using to increasing cash flow and making a bridge. Um, what you're talking about there with the 13 week cash flow forecasting, this is something that I always find quite amazing that so many architects don't have this in place. And it just gives you that kind of peace of mind and gives you the ability to be able to get into action and avoid these potential problems much, much sooner. Here at Business of Architecture, we also kind of track what's inside of your potential pipeline of prospective work. And we have targets and ranges for, you know, what happened, like, you know, that you've got to have at least X amount of dollars, like a million dollars worth of prospective work, what we would call unweighted. So there's no kind of weighting of its likelihood, but unweighted work, let's say a million dollars, and you've got to keep it topped up. And every time you close a project, that million dollar prospective work, it drops. And that's your trigger for, okay, we've got to get back onto the marketing cycle to, to fill it up. As opposed to, that's a, that's a kind of an alarm that goes off even before the 13-week cash flow, which is actually showing your, your committed work. But if you're in this situation and you're starting to see it happening, there are these strategies that you can execute on winning work, making sure you've got a solid pipeline, picking up the phone, etc. But I'm curious to go back to the this conversation around the fear of it and how the fear in these scenarios actually becomes magnified. And if if you're if you don't keep it in check, that's the sort of thing that makes you make very poor decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean fear isn't all bad. We have fear for a reason, right? I mean, there's a reason why I'm scared to to run across a freeway like I saw a guy doing the other day when I was driving home from Los Angeles. You know, there's there's a reason why I'm afraid to pick up a cobra. There's a reason why I'm afraid to stick my hand into a nest of, of bees, right? Like, so fear isn't isn't bad. 
in and of itself. But unfortunately, in the modern world, what's happened is we let, we let, it's easy to let fear overcome and drive our decisions. So as Ryan's saying, you know, what this looks like as a practice owner is that we start making decisions out of that fear, unwise decisions. So we start retreating into short-term strategies instead of keeping the eye on long-term strategies. Typically what happens a lot of times with small architectural practices is when they start getting into scarcity because of the economy or because of projects getting put on hold or, or mismanagement of projects or whatever happens that causes the cash flow to dip in a practice, they start cutting back on the things that give them life. So by the way, the worst piece of advice you get you could ever get from your accountant is cut back on your marketing budget. See, accountants are trained to be cost-focused, generally speaking, meaning they're there to make sure your company is running like a well-oiled machine. And oftentimes, not all not all accountants are like this, but many, they're just looking at the number like, oh, well, this category is very, very large. We need to get that down. Well, you need to be careful with that. As a business owner, you need to understand what is, you know, you're not going to take the milk away from the baby. It's like, man, this baby's drinking too much milk. We, we got to cut down on the milk supply here. Or the tree, this tree's taking way too much water. I mean, let's cut down on the water. And so what ends up happening is small practices, that you exacerbate the problem when you start making cuts to the things that bring in revenue. When you lack, uh, um, when we don't have an investment-based mindset, when we're looking at things from a cost-based mindset. Yeah. And so this, again, this it goes back us- to the psychology. And yeah, and this this ends up putting us in this kind of defensive position as opposed to an offensive position. Again, it, all of this echoes the, the the importance of of always to be selling and marketing and to have those skills being refined, so that when economic downturn happens, those who are already skilled at marketing, they know what works and they know that they can keep that that strategy open and they can put more money into it rather than be defensive and start cutting all these ideas, all of their marketing, all of their experiments, all of their innovation. They start retracting in that sense. The good marketeers, the good sellers, they double down on their marketing. They double down on their selling efforts to to go and hunt and win more work. And actually what we see with so many recessions and downturns is that they're are practices that swell up and do really, really well. And then there's a whole load of the younger saplings or the less evolved businesses that become the casualties. And it's a kind of, you know, it's a sort of reflection of a, of the more violent side of nature, if you like. The, the other thing I would um, bring to attention here as well is like we're talking about economic downturns and the kind of doomsday um news if you are consuming this kind of stuff you do need to make sure that you're having a very broad perspective on what's happening because on other parts of the news there's a lot of conversation from um macro economists talking about the greatest wealth transfer in human civilization that's kind of just beginning to start to take place which is that of the wealth of generation of the baby boomers who now we've got thousands upon thousands, probably millions and millions actually, of these really well-run small businesses all around the world that are now looking, that they, they work, they bring in profit, they're now looking for new owners. And there's assets, there's properties, there's all this sort of stuff that's either going to be passed on, inherited, or it's going to be up for grabs for sale, or there's a way that you can, you know, it's becoming available. So there's this, what they're calling a $30, a $30 trillion transfer of wealth between generations, which is not, that doesn't just mean inheritance. It means it's, it's open, it's available, it's there, it's on the market, it's there as opportunity. So, and that, when you start thinking about that and actually kind of delving into it and what it means and the fact that there are these you know, businesses which are going through transformations and lots of small businesses that are going through small profitable businesses that have got legacy and the well run, they're going through transformation. Fantastic. There's opportunity there. There's opportunity there for architects to be the ones that are, you know, helping facilitating the new identity of these companies as they 
as they get rehoused or relocated. Um, the more knowledge that architects have about business and can talk about business, they can start getting involved in higher level strategic conversations about that kind of succession. And you know, there's opportunity. There's opportunity here. A hundred percent. And here's here's the principle that that we 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 would just we we beg of you to take this on, which is understand that marketing and selling, these are skills, they're not things. So don't don't fall into the trap like I have in the past of thinking that, you know, well, when the recession comes, then I'll invest in marketing. Yeah, Ryan and Enoch, that sounds great. You know, now now I know. Now that you guys have told me when that when I start seeing my my income coming down, that's the time to start making some of these investment based mindset decisions. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way because you're not going to be able to go out and find a marketing company to do your marketing for you if you don't understand the principles of marketing yourself. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there peddling marketing. There's a lot of people out there peddling sales courses, selling professional services. And if you don't understand the the rudimentary, like the basic foundation of of how that stuff works, then you're you're not going to be able to manage the process. You're not going to be able to tell how to how to activate it, how to push it out in the marketplace. I was talking with a, a firm owner just the other day, and the firm owner said, "Well, yeah, I really don't like selling." And I was like, oh, "I get it. I don't like selling either. I mean, who does? I mean, there's probably a very small minority of human beings on this planet who actually really like selling." Like, but here's the thing, you're, you're a business owner. Like you understand that as a business owner, one of your roles is selling. And he was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. I said, so you have one of three options. So number one is go get a job and stop being a business owner. Number two is be a business owner who doesn't like selling and never learns how to sell because of your deep disgust or discomfort with selling and suffer all the consequences of not understanding how to sell professional services in a powerful way so that clients don't ask you, so they're not having you discount. So you're being able to charge very, very high fees for the work that you do. So you're not dealing with the clients who are ghosting you. So you're not dealing with tons of people canceling projects, right? And option number three is, well, learn how to sell, mm -hmm. how to sell, learn how to sell architectural services, learn a process for capturing good fees, for finding a fit with the right clients. It's not going to happen by accident, guarantee. Like there are very few natural born salespeople. Some of you listen to this, you may be natural born. You're like, I don't need any training. Put me in the worst recession in the world. I will be the person out there capturing large fees, winning huge commissions. Yes, there's going to be a small percentage of you who are that. That's not me. I've had to spend a lot of time investing in myself, understanding these principles so that we can share them with our architectural colleagues. So that's the principle I'm I'm hoping, Ryan, that that our, our probably our younger listeners can listen to and be like, Yeah, I'm seeing I'm seeing the wisdom in that. But the time to start is right now. Yeah. Start learning how to market. Okay. Start you will have it you will have a competitive advantage unlike any other when and, you learn how to and market. And also so. in today's digital world, you can market for, for free. You know, you don't have to have massive marketing spend, you don't have to spend loads on advertising. You do need to put in the energy and the time. Okay, but we've got these phenomenal networks. I mean, I was looking at Facebook the other day. There's 3 billion active users every month on Facebook. 3 billion active users? That it's like seriously 3 billion? Wow. Billion. That's Crazy. insane. That's insane. Crazy. That, like people are there. People are there. Like there's the ability to connect people, there's the ability for you to turn on your camera say some shit just like what we're doing here that's how we're just saying some shit <laughs> just saying <laughs> we're having a conversation you can put it out on the internet and there's going to be people who are going to find something about what you're saying interesting and compelling and you can start to learn the master of you know the, how to create an audience how to create grasp attention how to garner attention tick and then how to tick talk it's there it's for free Ryan, what's what's the what's the what do you think is the hottest social media property right now for someone who's looking to run a practice or on a practice? I mean, let's face it, Instagram's hot. But what's any any new stuff that you see it, coming out where you're like, this is? I I think the organic reach on LinkedIn is amazing at the moment, and you can put bits of content out there. We've we've got 
clients at the moment who are putting out bits of content and are getting amazing engagement. They're starting, they're driving conversations, they're connecting with developers, they're connecting with all sorts of people that they would never have thought was possible. Um, I think Facebook is really under underutilized as well. Again, 3 billion people that are on, that are on it. There are the new things, you know, obviously like, uh, well, not new so much anymore, but TikTok, the audience has matured on that. No longer is it, um, you know, dancing teenagers and lip syncing, but it's actually quite a sophisticated educational platform. Okay. Though in the US, didn't you guys ban it? Wasn't there a ban? I don't know. Back and forth. Something happened. Is, is TikTok, is TikTok, that's not the one who's uh, is owned by a Chinese company, is it? It is, yeah. By ByteDance. Uh, Byte do you know, do but, you know why? Do you, do you have any idea why the US wanted to ban it? They, there was some concern over data leakage and that, that ByteDance, even though it's a Chinese company, TikTok USA is run by a Singaporean dude. And, yeah. you know, it's a, it's under US law. It's an American company it abides by all of those kind of privacy rules and regulations. I don't know. I, don't know. I think it's a bit, I, what I do think is interesting, and this is kind of a little bit of a tangent is American and UK freedom of information and freedom of speech laws, if you like, mean that the government can't control the algorithms like the way the government controls control the algorithms in say china so when you go on tiktok in china it's like educational resources it's education on science it's um you know it's teaching kids african languages it's teaching kids oh, i thought algebra. it was just propaganda for mao zedong or something it's like you know it's it's like join the know, revolution they, it's yeah, well, there's a definitely a big chunk of 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 that as well but um there's you know it they're they're very tight on what's allowed to be shown and digested to to children whereas where we are you know kids can watch whatever they want and then there's a lot of people putting out a lot of crap and yeah. not in my house in know. my house i'm like i'm like the china of this of the sears family that's what you like the kids doing. the kids the kids are sending me these like can i download this app i'm like no denied can I get this game? No, denied. <laughs> What's this? Learn learn the name of animals. Okay, we can do that one. Okay, you know, approved. Oriented. Yeah, approved. <laughs> so, so, Brian, here we are to, con to conclude. Yeah, let's wrap this up. I I think be vigilant of your own fear. Take note of the different the different cash flow strategies that are available. Always be thinking. In the long term, invest in your marketing and sales always and forever. Amen.